Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, Vagif. Hello, everyone. Добрый день, добрый день. Um, well, uh, I don't think uh, I need to say much, many words to uh, present Scott Lashen because um, you, Scott, is quite uh, well known among Russian developers, uh, especially because of your book, Domain um, uh, Driven Design Made Functional, and also uh, blog posts in F Sharp for Fun and Profit. Um, but uh, today you mentioned uh, on a technical check that this uh, this is a talk which you never did before. Is that right? right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it uh, actually we are very pleased with that because uh, your talks are quite popular and often uh, you speak at uh, different conferences and there is a talk which you already did in another place. So for us to know that you specifically made it first for .next audience, I think it's it's, it's a great. So I won't use uh, uh, much time. Uh, uh, in, in addition to that, so I think I will let you speak uh, because your content usually is very uh, <laughs> content. But uh, yeah. is the talk equally applied to C sharp and F sharp developers? Because yes. you are known for your love for functional programming. That's right. So I this is uh, there's a, the first half of this talk is applicable to C sharp people, and then I give a little bit of F sharp later on in the talk. But I think any the C sharp people and in fact any any programmer can find something useful in this talk. It's not uh, specifically about F sharp or anything. Great. Okay, then without further ado, your words. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I think I'll get started now. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to say the name of the talk. This is a pipeline oriented programming. And again, my I'm on Twitter at uh, Scott Veloshin there. Um, my I have a website called F sharp for fun and profit. And which is about F sharp, as you can guess. I will put the slides and the Git repo and stuff I'm using, and the video eventually will be there uh, at the slash pipeline. <clears throat> and as I said in the intro, um, uh, this I'm going to give examples in C sharp and also in F sharp. And uh, in the beginning, I'll be using mostly C sharp, and I'll, I'll show you the same code in F sharp. And then at the end, I'll be using mostly F sharp. But I think every, I'm not going to use anything complicated. I think everyone will be able to understand. Uh, what I'm showing here. So I'm going to start by saying, what is pipeline-oriented programming? <clears throat> what do I mean by pipeline-oriented programming? So before I talk about that, let me talk about object-oriented programming and how it's different. So in object-oriented programming, you have this encapsulated system with a kind of black box. You send it a request, and you get back a response. This classic OO style. And, and the way the object handles that is it talks to other objects to get the work done. And those objects talk to other objects, which talk to other objects. And sometimes there'll be conversations back and forth between different objects. Um, and you know this is kind of classic OO programming. Um, one of the problems I have with this is that the arrows are going in all sorts of different directions. And uh, sometimes it can get quite confusing to figure out the flow of the data, uh, especially something like the visitor pattern, where you're kind of going back and forth between different things. <clears throat> so that's object-oriented. Now, in a pipeline-oriented programming, it looks like this. Um, and the arrows are all going in the same direction. Um, and there's just these little components, these little stages in the pipeline. And the data kind of flows through the pipeline left to right, or in you know whichever, whichever direction is convenient for you. But it always goes in one direction. So if you're used to Unix pipelines, in the in the command in the in the terminal, it's exactly the same, right? You have a, a you have a thing, and you pass it into another thing, and you pass it into another command. So exactly that idea. So that's what I call pipeline oriented programming, and we're going to try and apply it to all kinds of programming, not just you know command line. <clears throat> so what's interesting is you can actually apply it to all sorts of things that you might not think could be done this way. So web backends, you know, the traditional thing now is like an MVC type uh, model for doing web, web backends. But I'm going to demonstrate a, a, a pipeline-oriented model. If you think about a web uh, thing, there's a request that comes in and a response that comes out. And if you do it in a pipeline way, you have something that looks like this. Now, there is some branching. Yes, obviously, you have to make decisions. But the arrows still go in one direction, uh, and the data flows through in a very st straightforward way. So it's, I think it's much easier to understand. And I will actually be doing a demo of this uh, towards the end of the talk. So before I get into the code, let me just talk about some of the benefits of pipeline-oriented programming. Um, the first benefit, I think, is that they encourage 
uh, composability. It encourages you to design small pieces that can be composed together. And I like to use the Lego analogy. And in fact, I will use the Lego analogy in a minute. Um, they, they encourage you to follow good design principles. And the existing design principles, like the solid principles, they apply totally to pipelines. I'll talk about that too. I think they're easy to maintain. Um, I don't have any proof of that, but I, I think they are from my experience. Um, I think they make testing easier. And I think they fit really well with modern architectures like the onion architecture, the clean architecture, the hexagonal architecture, all that stuff. So I'll talk about some of those things later on. But let me just talk about the first few things. Um, let's talk about composability. So composable means like Lego, right? Everyone knows how to use Lego. So um, with Lego, you have these building blocks, and you can assemble them in different ways to make big things, right? Uh, and they're designed that way. That's the thing. It's not an accident that you can do that. They're designed to fit together. Um, you don't need any special adapters or anything. They literally are designed to fit together straight away. And that's what makes it such fun as, as something to play with. And if you design things this way, you can make bigger and bigger things from these basic small things. So you can make really big uh, Lego models from small, you know, from these small pieces. So that's what we want to do in our code. We want to bring that style of programming into our code as well. And so the pipeline approach really helps you think about that as well. If you design and if you think about pipelines, um, they really encourage you to design small pieces that can be connected uh, in lots of different ways. Um, and also, you don't need any special adapter. They literally can just be plugged into each other without having lots of overhead of special classes that are proxy classes or adapter classes or bridge classes, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so I think if you, if, you, if, if you do this, if the, the pipeline approach helps you build use, reusable components, which is really nice. And of course, you can take these components and you can build a bigger component and you can encapsulate it as a black box, right? So you can build them, you know, make a bigger pipe, a big thing out of a bunch of small things just like Lego. But what's nice about this bigger component is you cannot tell that it was built from the smaller components. So again, you've got this encapsulation, you've got the black box, just like you do with object oriented programming, but with the pipeline oriented programming instead. Now, the second benefit, I think, is that they follow the good design principles that you want to use anyway with OO. Um, so let me just talk about some OO principles, and I'll show you how they fit with pipeline-oriented programming. So the first one is the single responsibility principle. Well, you can't get much more single responsibility than a piece with one input and one output. It doesn't do anything else. It just does one thing. So if you do pipeline-oriented program, you cannot have a, a, a component that does too many things because it, it just doesn't work. It only has one input. So you get that for free. Um, the open and close principle. So this says that you should be able to add new functionality without changing existing code. Right? It's open for extension but closed for modification. Well, if I have a pipeline and I want to add new functionality, all I have to do is add a new thing at the end of the pipeline or in the middle of the pipeline. And so what I've done is I've extended the functionality, but I haven't changed the existing code. And because I haven't changed the existing code, I have a lot of confidence that I haven't broken anything. And um, I'll be doing a demonstration of that shortly as well. What about the strategy pattern? Well, that's pretty easy. You just have a kind of slot, and you feed something into this slot, uh, and there you go. That's all you need to have. I mean, it's pretty obvious how to do it. Uh, another one which is very common is the decorator pattern. So the idea is you have some component and you want to add extra behavior to it. Let's say you want to log the input and log the output. So you have a logging version of the original component. Well, you just put something in front and something at the end, and then you encapsulate it as a new component. And this component has exactly the same behavior as the original one, um, but it has this extra decorated behavior as well. So a lot of these patterns are really nice to do in pipeline-oriented programming, just as they are in OO programming. <clears throat> so what else do we have? I'm going to show an example of that one, too. Um, I think they're easy to maintain. And, and I don't really have any proof of this. Um, but I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll just kind of show you why I think so. If you, if you look at the pipeline one below, I think this is easy to maintain because the arrows are in one direction. And you don't have these kinds of loops. You don't have back and forth you know, twisted things. Um, with the object-oriented program, it's very easy, very easy to accidentally make it very, very complicated without even trying. It's very, you, you know, there's principles to follow, but it's very easy to accidentally make it very, very complicated. And I actually have a, a graph here that I built from a real, this is from a real DLL, um, a C-sharp DLL, 
And this is object-oriented code. And this is all the connections between the different components, the dependencies between them. And uh, first of all, you can see it's very complicated. And this is just even a small part of it. Um, but the, what you can't see is the arrows are actually going in all different directions. And in fact, some arrows are going in circles, like this one depends on this, which depends on this, which depends on this, and you end up back. And these circular dependencies are terrible because they they make it impossible to refactor. Uh, they make it they break the layering of the code and stuff. So really bad things to, to do. Now, if you look at a, a piece of code that was built with the um, uh, pipeline oriented approach, the dependencies. The first of all, there are fewer dependencies because they only depend on the things before and after them. Um, and secondly, again, even the dependencies, all the arrows go in one direction. So uh, this is what code looks like when you when you build it this way. It just tends to be easier to understand. So and this, by the way, has the same functionality as the as the OA. This is two different, the same functionality built in two different styles. So this is not, and what you can't see from this graph again is the arrows all go in the same direction. So um, a couple more benefits is the testing benefit and the architecture benefit, and I will talk about those at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so let's move on to how do you do this in practice? So I'm going to start with some C-sharp code, and this is a for loop, um, a, a, uh, on the second, I just got a message coming in here. <clears throat> um, this is a, a C-sharp for loop, and um, it's kind of hard to understand what's going on sometimes. Um, you can figure it out, but it's not particularly obvious. Now, if I if I compare the same loop written using link, uh, I think it's a lot easier to understand what's going on. Now, it might not be as performance, but it's a lot easier to see what's going on. Um, you know, I'm adding two to everything, and then I'm filtering by you know, if they're bigger than a certain number, and I'm counting them, and so on. So, I think link is a really good example of sort of pipeline oriented programming in C sharp, right? You're just chaining, you're passing the data through a series of steps. So let's look at some of the benefits, the composability benefit. The way that link is built is that each component is built to fit with all the other components, right? You have a, you have a toolkit of different things, and you can mix and match them in any combination. So I could have a select and another select, and I could do a where, and I could do a sort, and I could do another where. And you know, there's all these different things, but you can combine them in many, many different ways. You don't have to like start from scratch every single time. So that's Link is an excellent example of this. And what I'm trying to say is, uh, hopefully, you can write your own code this way as well. Um, again, we've got the single responsibility principle. Um, each Link component does one thing and one thing only. Right, the where clause just does you know filtering, and the select just does selecting, and the count only does count. And you build up and you assemble them to to make something useful. But in terms of testing, it's not easy to test because each one does one thing. And when you assemble them, you're pretty confident the whole thing's going to work because you trust that the individual components have already been tested. And here we go. Here's I'm adding an extra where clause. Right, so that's before and that's after. I can add an extra where clause without. And I have confidence that I haven't broken anything, right? Because of, because of the way Link works. So Link is an excellent example of pipeline-oriented programming and the benefits of it applied to regular code. Now, let me just show you the same code in F Sharp. Um, F Sharp doesn't have Link, or it actually does have Link, but in, in F Sharp we'd normally use these map and filter, which is basically the same kind of thing. Um, but I do want to show you this pipe operator. So in F Sharp, um, we use this piping, which is very much like the Unix piping, you know, that the list goes into the map function that comes out of the map function, goes into the filter function, and so on. Uh, and instead of using the vertical bar, F sharp uses the vertical bar with an angle bracket, uh, because the vertical bar means something else. So that vertical bar angle bracket is the F sharp pipe operator, and it's, it works basically the same way as the Unix pipe operator does. So, and I'm doing the same thing as I would do in link. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about immutability. Mutability is becoming more and more problem, uh, more and more uh, common in uh, most people's code now. And if you have immutable data, you're probably going to need some sort of pipeline. And let me let me show you why. So here is an immutable person, and you know I create the person, and then I want to change the name, and then I want to change the email, and then I want to change the age or something. And each time I do that, right, I'm creating a new copy of the person. Um, so I have all these different versions of this kind of person floating around. And it gets uh, really, really confusing. 
<clears throat> and ugly as well. So what's a better way? What's a better way that, of doing this? Well, here we go. I'm just going to take the person and I'm going to feed it into the name, and I'm going to take the output of that and feed it into the email. So it's exactly the same code, but I just think this is the pipeline approach, right? It just looks much nicer, right? So every time you have immutable data, you're going to be wanting to feed it through a pipeline. Um, uh, it's just going to be the standard way to deal with immutable. And if you think about link, uh, the, the enumerables are immutable, right? So you have to feed them through the pipeline that way. Um, now, let's talk about extension methods versus pipes. So in C Sharp, like link, we're using extension methods. And in F Sharp, we're using pipes. So what is the difference? Why, why are there two different concepts here? And the answer is that pipes are, are more general. Uh, and let me, let me show you why. Let, let me, let's say that we have a bunch of um, very basic arithmetic. You add one and square a number and double a number, something very simple. And I have this uh, thing where I'm adding one to five, and then I'm squaring it, and then I'm doubling it. Now, this is this kind of deeply nested call that can be quite hard to understand. And I'm looking at this, and I say, well, I'd, I'd like to make this easy to understand. I'd like to make it more composable and so on. Let me use a pipeline. So I rewrite the code to look like this. But that doesn't work, right? Of course that doesn't work, because those things are not actually extension methods. So I, this, this is not going to work. But I want to have the same idea. So what I can do is I can create a helper function that will turn any uh, normal function into an extension method. And now I'm going to I'm going to write that right now for you. <clears throat> it's called pipe. So that's what the pipe function does is it turns things into extension methods. Um, so I, let me just go through it. First of all, I have an input which is the extension part, and that is the data that is being passed down the pipeline, right? Um, and then the second parameter is the function or the method that I want to convert into an extension, uh, and then I basically just call that function or call that method with the input. So the implementation is really easy. So let me show you what it looks like when I actually um, use it in 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 the math in a, in a very simple example. So yeah, it's a little complicated to with all the inputs and outputs and stuff. But it's basically you have the input and you have a function and you just call the function and it's just been converted into an extension method. So with that pipe uh, extension method, I can take anything and and run it this way. So this works. This is actually perfectly good code. And so I'm taking five and I'm feeding it into add one. I take the output of that, feed it into square, and take the output of that and feed it into double. So you can, with this pipe thing, you can you can actually work with any function which is not an extension fu uh, function, uh, right? Which is very nice. So um, any existing function, except there's a rule they can only have one input, right? Because all these functions have one input and one output. However, we can fix that. That's easy enough to do. We just write another kind of pipe, right? Here's the next one. Now let's 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 have a look at some examples where it wouldn't work, right? Add where there's two parameters, or multiply where there's two parameters. So those ones would not be to work with the pipe. So if we want to get these ones to work with pipe, we need a new kind of helper function. And here it is. It's called pipe. Uh, it's exactly the same as the previous one, except now I have another parameter. So I pass in an extra parameter, and then I just call my function with that extra parameter. So same name, it's just a different, it's an overload of the of the original pipe one. Okay, and you can see that we could do this with two parameters, three parameters, four parameters, very easy to do. So if I have this additional pipe extension, I can then write my code like this. I can say pipe and into add, add one, and pipe into times two. So I can actually get all the benefit of a, of a multi-parameter function still with his pipeline approach. So now we really can work with any existing function and feed it through the pipeline. So that's really, really nice. <clears throat> so there it is. There's my extra parameter. And there it is. I'm passing that extra parameter in to the pipe operation. OK, so why bother with all this stuff? Um, because you get all the benefits of a pipeline. right? I can um, add things to the pipeline right there's without. And I can add things, and I can move things around, and I can inject things, and all the stuff. The pipe, all the benefits of pipeline now we, we had that we didn't have before. With the nested version, it would be harder to, to work with. And another way to think about it is if you're doing a code review, the diffs look nicer. If I had a nested version and I was added new functions, the diffs would be kind of messed up. If I'm doing this pipeline thing and I add a new piece of functionality at the bottom, the diff in your code review 
is really clean. It's just really obvious that I added a new line of code here, right? It's really obvious to see what I added. So yes, this is a very trivial example. You probably wouldn't do it for such a simple example, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the, the concept to you. And this, by the way, this is what the same code looks like in F sharp. I have the pipe and the add one and the times two. So it's very similar in F sharp as in um, C sharp. <clears throat> right. F sharp, by the way, uses pipelines everywhere. We don't use extension methods in F sharp, but we use pipelines. And you can see why. This is F sharp is a pipeline oriented programming language. Right. One more thing about extension methods is that they don't work in some cases because they can't be used as parameters. So if I have um, a bunch of link calls like this, and I have a function that I want to feed in as, as my strategy pattern, um, if I'm trying to inject this into the pipeline, I can't because it, it doesn't work. Uh, you can only use extension methods there. So you can't do that. However, um, if I use a pipe, then I can. So the pipe allows you to do things like inject functions that you wouldn't be able to do if you were just using extension methods. So, that's, so pipes are a bit more useful in general than extension methods. I mean, extension methods are nice, but pipes are, are better. So that's the good way of doing it. Right, now let's look at some uh, stuff in practice. <clears throat> I'm going to give you three demonstrations. Uh, first is pipeline-oriented Roman numerals, and then I'm going to do pipeline-oriented FizzBuzz, and then I'm going to do pipeline-oriented web API, as, as I promised. So let's start with the Roman numerals. Um, so we want to, this is a very common you know, simple programming challenge, convert an integer into Roman numerals. So five becomes V, 12 becomes X11, 107 becomes CV11, and so on. <clears throat> so how can we do that? Well, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but I'm gonna take a very, very simple approach, which is the tally approach, where you just make marks on a piece of paper. When you get to five, you put a slash through it. And when you get to 10, you put two slashes through it. And I think that's where the, the, the V and the X probably came from, right? So we're going to start with, let's say, 12, 12 copies of one. And then we're going to place five ones with a V. And then every time you see two Vs, we'll put an X. And every time you see five Xs, we'll put an L, and, and so on and so forth. So that's a really, really simple algorithm. And what's great about this particular algorithm is it works really well for a pipeline model. So here is the pipeline version. right? I take the I, I replicate however many times, and I replace five Is with a V two Vs of the next, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so here's the um, C-sharp version, C-sharp implementation. See, it's really easy. I'm just doing a bunch of replaces in a row. So that's the pipeline thing. And what's nice about this, again, is with this design, you can, you can extend it without changing the existing code. So for example, you might have noticed that I don't have the special cases with like one V to be four, or one X to be nine. How can I how can I change this code to handle those cases? Well, I just add them to the bottom. So I've got v111 becomes 1x and 1111 becomes 1v and so on. Really easy to do. So that's one of the benefits of this pipeline approach. Uh, here's the F sharp code, again, very similar. See, I'm using the pipeline operator here rather than the dots, rather than the extension method, or the, you know, in in well, it's not an extension method in C sharp, but you can see they just use pipelines everywhere in F sharp. But basically, very similar looking code. Right, now let's talk about FizzBuzz. <clears throat> so I think everyone's familiar with FizzBuzz. You just print out uh, numbers one to n, but every time it's a multiple of three, you print out Fizz. Every time it's a multiple of five, you print Buzz. And three and five, you print FizzBuzz. So here is the C sharp implementation of this. If it's 15, if it's divisible by 15, print FizzBuzz. If it's divisible by three, print fizz. If it's divisible by five, print buzz, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, just print the original number. Okay, so that's the, the standard implementation, and there's nothing wrong with this implementation, but um, we're not going to use this implementation because it's too easy to write. No, it's not because it's too easy. It's because it's not composable. What happens if we want to change this around a bit? This is a very hard-coded implementation. It's, it's hard to test. You can't really test the individual pieces. You have to test the whole thing. So let's make a composable version of FizzBuzz that we can use the pipeline-oriented approach for. So here's the pipeline implementation. We're going to handle the first case, and then we're going to handle the second case, and then we're going to handle the third case, and then we're going to handle the fourth case, or the last case. Right? We're going to build a bunch of little steps, individual components. Now, how do we handle a case? How do we handle one of these things? Well, 
there's actually two choices. The first choice is that you leave it alone, like you can't handle it, like two or seven or something. And then the second choice is you do handle it and you, you, you put back a string like fizz or buzz. <clears throat> so there's two possible outputs. And that data has to be passed down the pipeline to the next case, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a special data structure that I'm going to pass down the pipeline. This is quite a common thing you have to do for this is you have to create special data structures, but it's one line of code. So it's not that big a deal. Um, and it's got two fields. One is the output, and the other is the number that's being passed around. Now, the output is going to be blank. If I haven't handled it, if nobody else has handled it, it's going to come into me as blank. And if I don't handle it, I'm going to pass it out as blank. And if I do handle it, I'm going to add fizz or buzz to it. Right? <clears throat> so here's how the code looks like. So I'm going to have the data that's going to be passed into the pipeline. I've got the divisor, which is either three or five and then the output, which is fizz or buzz. And then I basically check, is the output been handled already? Then I ignore it. If the, if, is the number divisible by whatever? If it, if it isn't, I ignore it. Otherwise, I return a new data structure with the output that I want. So that's the implementation. And um, again, you can see this is an extension method on the, on the record type, so that works fine. So if I actually put the code together, what I do is I start with an empty data structure and I handle the 15 case, I handle the three case, I handle the five case, and then I do the final step, which is converting it to a, you know, which I'm not going to show you. Um, and then finally, to do the whole list of numbers, I just take a list of numbers and I do a select on those. So what I've got here is I've actually got two pipelines. I've got my first pipeline to do one single number, and I've got another pipeline to do a, a, a list of numbers. And then I can take the list, the list of strings at that point and just print them out. So this is the pipeline-oriented version of FizzBuzz. So let me do a quick demo. And uh, here we go. Here's pipeline, here's F sharp code. <clears throat> so this is my F sharp pipeline. And so, as I said, one of the really nice things about this approach is it's really easy to extend with new functions, right? I can put a seven in there and then I can run it. And let's see what it says. There it is. I've got seven. Uh, oh, I put buzz here and I'll put my zap here. So I should now get every on the seventh item, I should see a zap. And there it is, there's a zap and a zap on 14. And then, so that's, you know, and I can keep adding and adding. So this is much more composable than the original one was. And I can also add some logging. So I can, this is kind of the decorator approach. I'm going to put a logger for before. And I'm going to put a logger for after. And now I can just run this interactively again. And now what you'll see here is I've just added the logging into the thing. So before the, the number was 35 and after it was buzz, right? And, um, oh, I, you know, I see. So one of the problems is I didn't add 35 as a combination of three and seven. So that's another way. One of the problems with this approach is we're not handling, you know, I haven't handling these ones special. Now, one way is to, is to feed the data through. And, and just append to the data. But let me show you another, another little trick, which is to run them in parallel. So what I can do is I can take all these handlers and I can run them in parallel against the initial data. So that gives me, if I got three handlers, I get three strings. And then, as, and then I just combine them together. So if I write a combining function, which looks like this, and the combining function just concatenates the two outputs. If I have a combining function, um, and I run all these handlers together. I can actually I get that for free because it combines it combines them together. So now if I do the one to thirty five, we should have handled the thirty five case for me. If I go over to thirty five, not sure why that didn't work. I just got I just got I'm getting some errors here. There we go. And if I go to 35, it's got buzz zap for me. So obviously, I, I don't really care about doing parallel processing for FizzBuzz. But the fact that it's because I designed it to be componentized, uh, I, can, I can mix and match the components, just like with Link. Obviously, this is a very silly example. But just like with Link, I can take my components and I can 
order them in different ways. I can run them in parallel and combine them. And I wouldn't have done that if I had the original version of the code. Um, I could never have done that with this, right? This code is, is harder to test. I can't really mix and match. If I do change it, I'm worried that I might break something. So um, this is basically the idea of componentized things. Using a pipeline forces you to componentize your code, and that's a good thing. Right, let's look at the pipeline, the web API. So I said that you could do a, a pipeline-oriented web API. Uh, how can you even do that? I mean, most people are used to you know controllers and views and models and all this stuff. How can what what do you even do um, as your as your component? So let me show you. What we're going to do is have a web component, and the input is an HTTP context. So an HTTP context it contains a request, a response, the cookies, everything you need to process the web, right? And then the output is it either handled it or it didn't handle it. Now, if it handled it, it could handle because it matched something in the request, or it handled it by writing something in the response, or both. And if it didn't handle it, it would just you know return nothing, right? So there's two possible outputs again. Um, and this is very similar to middleware. If you're used to uh, middleware in uh, ASP.NET, uh, you'll see that there's the same kind of thing. So this is actually even simpler than middleware. The middleware, you have to handle it both ways. This, this one is just, uh, all it does is handle one thing. So if you actually look at the kind of implementation, I'm going to represent this as a, like a little bit of a, a, a railway track with a success branch uh, and a failure branch. So again, the, the input comes in and if it succeeds, it returns another context, which might be a modified context because I've written to the response or something. Um, and if it doesn't succeed, I'm just going to turn null. And it's going to actually going to be an async because everything's async in the web. So it's actually an async. It returns an async uh, HTTP context. So let's look at a real example of a component. Let's look at something called get. So this is my first component. And all it does is it looks at the verb that goes in the request, and is it if it's get, it's yes, and if it's not get, it fails. That's all it does. That's the one thing it does. It's a single responsibility. You can't get much more single responsibility than that. <clears throat> OK, let's look at another one. This one is called route or route, and all it does is match the path that has been passed in in the request. So either it matches or it doesn't match, OK? And, 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 and that's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. It's single responsibility. Uh, let's look at another one, setting the status code. So all this, this one does is write the status code uh, in the response, right? So another component, uh, and this one always succeeds. It just, you know, it always works. It just writes, it just changes the response. <clears throat> so there you go. There's three different components that we can use to kind of assemble to make a, a web app. So here's the question. In my pipeline, how do I assemble these things? Now, I can't just use a regular pipe because it's much more complicated. The connection is a bit more complicated, right? You can see they don't really fit together. But there is a way of doing it. Uh, and it's not the regular pipe operator. We have a special pipe for web components, which has a slightly different symbol. It's an angle bracket equal angle bracket. But this one will allow these things to be assembled into a pipeline. Um, so uh, I'm really not going to say too much about how to do it. I mean, if you're thinking, how do you actually do it? Here's the trick. This is why I use the railway analogy, because how would you do this with the railway? It would look like this, right? So that's before and that's after. So that's the trick is turning into like a two-track railway. But anyway, I'm not going to get into how it works, but uh, just let you know that it does work pretty well. Now, here's another component I want to show you, which is called choose. And what this one does is you pass in a web component and another web component and another web component, and it picks the first one that works. So it just goes down the list, right? Because some they, they all can succeed or fail, right? And it finds the first one that works and returns that one. Now, if none of them work, the whole thing fails. So choose itself is a success or failure kind of thing, right? The whole choose can also fail. So the choose is actually a, a piece of railway track just like the other ones. OK, so we've got a bunch of components. Now how do we build a real web app? Let me show you what it might look like. So I'm going to put a choose. And I'm going to say, if it's a get, and if the root is this, then output hello with a 200. And if it's a get and the root is this, then output goodbye. And if it's neither of these, fail. So there's a very simple web app written through as a pipeline within another pipeline. Right? I've got 
each of these is a horizontal pipeline and I've got my vertical pipeline. So that's a very simple web app. And what's really nice about this is that this approach is a pipeline oriented programming approach because I could add a new uh, piece of code without touching the rest of the code, right? That's the, all the benefits of pipeline. I've got a new route. I'm going to add, if you, if you post to this uh, place, you're going to get a bad request, right? Um, and if I post to this one, then you have to be logged in and you have to be uh, uh, in this role and, and et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you know, you can, you can see that it's really easy to add new components. You can write your own components very easily. Like I need to load something from the database. I need to save something to the database. I need to serialize something to JSON or deserialize something from JSON. All those little things, they just fit into your pipeline. So this is pipeline oriented programming applied to a web app. So, and again, each of these components is small, they're reusable, they're testable in isolation, and they're composable in lots of different ways, just like Link. So the Link model, this is just like Link, but applied to a web app. So it's really, really nice. So let me do a demo of this as well. So I'm going to show you the code here. <clears throat> so this is my code, and it says if I go to the ping, I'm going to spit out some text. And if I go to this one, I spit out some text. And here I have a special handler. So if you pass in an extra parameter here, it's going to go into the goodbye handler. What does the goodbye handler do? Well, it's a handler I wrote myself. And all it does is print out the name and, and turn it into a text. Okay. And then uh, for this one, I'm going to take my record and turn it into JSON. So I'm going to serialize it. Uh, and there's my little record. Okay. It's kind of like a very simple thing. Um, now, this one, goodbye, if I post to this one, it's going to give me an access denied. So this is a component that I wrote myself as well. And how did I write it? Well, I just assembled it from two other pieces. I assembled it from the the uh, 401 status code and I and then the text uh, thing. And finally, if you go to the uh, home page, I'm just going to load up this HTML file. Now, obviously, I'm serving static content here, but in a, you know, in a real program, you'd serve the static content differently. So here's the static content. It's just really just got a bunch of buttons on it, so I can play with all these things for you. So let me open up this code with a bit of luck. And this is a uh, real live to prove that it's actually working. This is a, the, um, definitely this is .NET Core uh, ASP.NET. And here's my little buttons. So if I do ping, I get back Pong. And if I do hello, I say that I got hello. And if I post a hello, that's my little JSON that I would print out. And if I say goodbye to a certain person, and you can see it really is using it's not hard coded. I can put in any uh, any parameter here, and it will work. And um, if I do this last one, post a goodbye, that was going to give me the warning. And I do, I get access denied. And just to prove that it was access denied, let me just do it again. And you can't quite see here, but it's, I'm getting a 401 in my console here. So it's definitely working. This is a whole full web app. And um, I think you can see it's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, let me go back to the code. Let me just kill, kill it and go back to the code. So that is a full web app. And I, I'm having to write user F sharp for this because C sharp really doesn't work this way. But um, you get the idea that I can build really quite complicated things, build these components. Each component does one thing, and I can assemble them together. Right, so let me just finish up. Um, by the way, this, this framework is called Giraffe. So it's easy to remember. There's a little giraffe here, F sharp giraffe, and you'll find out all about it. <clears throat> so testing an architecture. I said that it would, I think it helps with this. Um, I think the pipelines encourage good architecture because um, the, the modern architectural styles, the, the classic kind of end tier architecture is kind of old fashioned now. And the modern thing is to have the onion architecture or the clean architecture, the ports and adapters, hexagonal. They all really have something in common, which is you have your domain logic in the middle, and everything uh, to do with the infrastructure or the outside world, the databases, all that stuff, that's on the outside, right? So you, you keep your core logic separate from the outside world. Now, this works really well for pipeline uh, programming because, again, you'd have a pipeline, and you have your I.O. at the edges, and you have your domain logic in the middle. Um, and this, the domain logic in the middle does not know about the outside world. This is pure... Uh, pure code, right? Code that has this predictable, that's deterministic, that has no side effects. 
um, you keep all the I.O. at the edges. Now, one thing about the pipeline model and compared to the O.O. model is that it's kind of easy to enforce this because um, you, you know anything with a database call, you just keep it at the edges and you don't have database stuff in the middle of your code. With O.O., it's easy to mix up you know, database stuff and network stuff in the right in the middle of your objects. The objects tend to do too many things. So um, I, I think this helps you actually enforce this design. So here we go. Here's another, here's another version of the pipeline. So you have your IO at the edges, and you have your business logic in the middle. And again, I think you just don't, you don't mix your database code and your business logic together. And so there's a lot of benefits to doing this. And I say it, it really comes naturally when you do pipeline-oriented stuff. <clears throat> Here's how basically it works. You basically load your data, right? Um, you make all your decisions, and you, you do your business logic, and then you decide, what am I going to do with the data? Well, you know, you write it back to disk, or you send it back on the network, or whatever it is. But you keep the I/O separate from the from the business logic. And if you do need to mix them up, yeah, sometimes you need to have more than one thing, but you try and keep them as separate components. So you have your pure code, your predictable code, deterministic code, and then your unpredictable I/O, and then your predictable pure code, and then your unpredictable I/O. Keep them separate. Really important. So if you do keep them separate like this, the testing becomes so much easier. So again, here is our here's our little pipeline. The middle bit is completely predictable. Every time you give it the same input, you get the same output. Um, and this is the non-deterministic bit. Every time you read from the database, you might get something completely different. You read from the network, who knows what you might get. So that's completely unpredictable, right? So by keeping them separate, your testing becomes very much easier because all you have to do is have unit tests on the middle bit and integration tests on the, on the overall thing. So the unit tests, with the same input, you always get the same output. That's super easy to unit test, right? This isolated, which is exactly what you want unit tests to be. And the integration tests are also important, but that's where you load up the database and you make sure that all the database stuff works and the network uh, works and all that stuff. But if you follow this pattern of designing your code this way, um, your testing becomes much easier as well. So it's lots, lots, and lots of benefits. So just to finish up, why bother, right? Now, I, I, I mean, I made it seemed like I made things a little complicated, like the fizzbuzz was much more complicated than the original one. You know, adding adding one to a number and and squaring it, I made it much more complicated than the original one. But yeah, these are trivial examples. Um, but in general, why would you bother with an approach like this uh, if it makes it a bit more complicated? Well, the answer is, is I don't think it does make it more complicated in the long run. So what it does is it forces you to build reusable components. And again, using link as a great example of this. Link, you know, it's a little bit more complicated to understand, but once you understand how it works, you can you can be much more productive with it than just writing your full loops by hand. Um, it's also much more understandable. Again, if you compare link code to the, a for loop, the link code, if you once you understand how link works, you can read it and you can say, yeah, I, I know exactly what this is doing because I can see at each step what it's doing. So because it flows in one direction, um, I think it makes stuff easy to understand. And the same thing even with the, the fizzbuzz, um, you can see that I'm handling the three, I'm handling the five, and I'm handling the seven. If I got them out of order, it would be really, really obvious with the, with the pipeline-oriented one. If I got them out of order in the for loop one, it might not be so obvious, right? Um, it's extendable. Um, I can add new parts very easily. So you saw in the Roman numerals, I could add some new kind of Roman numerals without changing anything. Uh, in the fizzbuzz, I could add some new... Uh, Fizzbuzz things without changing anything, and in the web app, I could easily add web app things. I could add, you know, authentication. I take my existing pipeline and I just stick authentication on top of it, or I can stick logging right in the middle if I'm not, you know, seeing something. Or, you know, the, 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 the possibilities are endless because again, using Link as a model, you've got these components and you can mix and match the components to make all sorts of interesting things. Um, testability, again, each piece does one thing. Each piece really is the single responsibility principle at work. Uh, rather than having a complicated tangle of things, you have these very simple components, each which does one thing well. And again, if you go back to the Unix command line, you know the Unix command line utilities, they work exactly. Each utility does one little thing, and then you pipe them. But you, know, you take the output, and you feed it into the next one, you feed it into the next one. Same idea, this kind of small components is very good. And finally, I think, it's always good to learn new things. There's a different way of thinking. Um, when Link first came out, I think a lot of people had a lot of trouble with it. It was a different. It kind of hurt their brain to think about it. I think Link is you now everyone is familiar with Link now, and people don't seem to complain about it. 
but it's you know it, it's definitely a different way of thinking. You start thinking about solving problems in a different way. So if I wasn't doing pipeline oriented programming, I might not have solved the Roman numerals one that way. As soon as you say, how could I do this with pipeline approach? You start seeing different ways of solving the problem, and often the sometimes the, the approach is actually simpler. I think the Roman numeral one is actually simpler than a lot of other ones that I've seen. So. Um, does pipeline-oriented programming work for every single situation? No, it doesn't. Uh, I'm not selling this as a thing that solves all your problems. You should always use it everywhere. No, that's 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 stupid. Nobody should use the same technique everywhere. But what I do think is it should be part of your toolkit. Right? Every programmer should have a bunch of tools, a, a bunch of techniques that they know how to do, and I think this should be one of them. So you know, every tool, every programmer should understand how databases work, for example. Every programmer should understand how object-oriented programming works. Every programmer should understand how domain-driven design works. I think this is a, this is something which is very important to me, domain-driven design. Um, and also, every programmer should understand how to do pipeline-oriented programming, because that way you can pick and choose. Like Sometimes you say, well, I think pipeline-oriented would be better for this, and sometimes I think object-oriented would be better. right? So you can choose. But if you don't have the technique, if you don't understand the technique, then you can't even. it's not even available to, for you to use it. And that's why you get some really ugly looking object oriented programming because sometimes they could have done it simpler but they didn't people weren't even aware there was another way of doing it so i do encourage you to learn about this technique uh, i think it's really really powerful so <clears throat> i think that is the end of my time here um uh, i'm going to put the slides and video up at uh, my website there in fact that site that link is is available right now um uh, i have the slides there and i also have a, a git repo which has the C sharp code and the F sharp code. So if you want to play around with the code that I demonstrated today, uh, you can play around in your own time. Um, I have some other interesting talks. If you like this kind of thing, I have a whole talk on the power of composition, which I did at dot next about three years ago, I think, or two or three years ago. And um, I also have a great talk called Railway Oriented Programming, which people seem to like. Again, that has this whole pipeline model of error handling, how to do error handling with a pipeline oriented approach. Uh, I have a whole book called Domain Modeling Made Functional. And uh, if you want to contact me on Twitter, uh, I'm at, uh, at Scott Vloshen on Twitter. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And I've actually finished a little bit early, so I think we've got plenty of time for some questions. So I'm not sure if there are any questions yet. Uh, I don't know, Vagif, yeah? Talk that uh, you are a little thrilled because it's the first time you're making this talk. But judging from number of questions we receive, uh, I can say that the people are very interested. Okay, good. In what you said, um, and we don't usually get, to be honest, so many questions as, <laughs> as we got today. Okay. Uh, and it will be interesting to go through them. First, I will uh, start with the one uh, that is not related necessarily uh, um, to your talk, but more to your website. It's a question from actually from our member of our program committee, Maxim Arshinov. Um, he asks if you are interested in uh, initiative that somebody will translate your sharp upon a profit website into Russian, because for <coughs> for many Russian developers, uh, it's still preferable to read such materials in Russian. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy. Yeah, I think I, you know, I think there was an email. I, I, I think it came. You think you might have sent me an email. I probably got lost in my email, so I apologize um, mm -hmm. but for not responding to that. But yes, I, I'm actually happy for that. Yeah. Oh, okay, so he will get back to you about. Yeah, it. yeah, and I, I apologize that it that it got lost in my email. So no problem. <laughs> Just, <laughs> okay, then back to your actual talk. Uh, the question from Alexander Ivanets. Um, the question is. Um, can we reuse a subcomponent of one big component in another big component? And when I think more about the question, it uh, I think a little bit about <coughs> like visi visibility. Within F sharp, uh, things are public by default, so you yes. have to declare them explicitly private, and, there, and there, therefore it's it's very easy sort of to combine things without thinking about what uh, <coughs> declared where. But with uh, C Sharp and Java, uh, by default, we get private things. So when thinking about pipeline-oriented programming, um, uh, maybe uh, Alexander partly uh, think, uh, thinks about this thing, that, okay, you have some components, and this is uh, defined inside other scopes. So how 
and you want to, to use it in uh, yeah. other couples. That's the, the thing about. I mean, that's the problem with reusable stuff anyway, right? I mean, if it's if you want to make it genuinely public, you have to make it public, and you have to also obviously you know have good documentation and have good error handling. So yes, it's more work uh, to make things public. And if if I was going to um, like Link is a good example. It's a public library. It's actually you know well documented, and it's they thought about it. Not like my my FizzBuzz little components. That's not really that's not really useful to anybody outside that particular piece of code. So they don't really need to be public outside my code. Um, they just be public within my DLL or public even within my uh, you know file. Um, but even even that though, it, even within my small domain, the fact that I've made components means that I can easily add and test them. So that's nice. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they don't have to be public public. But if they are, if you do think of a, if if you if there is a piece of uh, code that you want to reuse, then that's always a problem. You know, uh, making shared codes, making a piece of useful co code um, more widely shared. What is nice though is these components do tend to be small, so. Uh, it's I, I can share that one little piece without having to share make everything else public. If there's one particular uh, thing that I need, I can. I, it's, it's often it's often easy. It's just quite easy to refactor that um, into into something that's shareable. But yeah, that's a tough problem for any kind of code sharing. Mm -hmm. Private versus public is a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. That question I think it's related also to. <laughs> To what Alexander asked about uh, pipelines and single responsibility principles. Since uh, we can talk about components and subcomponents, and then, okay, there is some sort of lowest level which is single responsibility, but uh, so how okay is it to uh, make part of pipelines actually aggregated pipelines, which, ag which actually internally uh, run some other pipelines? What do you think yes. about this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, how you build these, you have a lot of choice. Right, so I mean, you saw in my FizzBuzz, I had actually a, a small pipeline, and then that was used within a a, 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 a link pipeline. Um, yeah, it's very common. I'd like say in F Sharp, everything's a pipeline. So the idea, it's not really even a special technique in F Sharp. It's just the way everything is done that way. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm really kind of showing this off, really for more like for C Sharp people, because I just want people to be aware of it as a, as a useful technique. But uh, I mean, F Sharp. It's very common where you have a little piece of code and it has a pipeline, and then that little piece of code is used in a bigger pipeline. Yeah, I mean it's super common. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's not, it's not even, it's not even special. It's so, it's so common, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, question or maybe comment from um, C Sharp developer: uh, Couldn't you use with keyword in C Sharp? Instead of your own extension methods like with name, etc. And this question actually had to make Google. Yes. About uh, modern keywords in C sharp <clears throat> because it's a long time since I used yes. C sharp and I did I actually wasn't aware that this was available with record type. There is, and I I, I deliberately didn't do that because I wanted to demonstrate. I mean, I could the modern C sharp uh, has the with keyword now, so I didn't have mm -hmm. to write my own methods for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I just I was I was really showing. I didn't want to introduce new syntax for people who weren't familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and if anyone, any Java people are watching this or something, I just didn't want to enter it. But yeah, totally in C sharp, you could use the with the with mm -hmm. uh, thing. So if you, if you yeah. uh, started using records, that's uh, possibly okay to use it that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then another question uh, from Pavel uh, Zinov: Isn't arrows all over the place? Is just bad OP design. One could argue that pipelines approach and one direction execution can also be achieved with clean OP code. I personally think that uh, dependency injection containers made us not really think about connections anymore, but they surely make the life easier. Yes, absolutely. I mean, OL code can be very clean. The problem is that the it's very easy uh, to take something and just add another thing to it. Like you have, often, I mean, the problem I see all the time is you have an interface and then you add another method to the interface, and you add another method to the interface, and then you add some other things, and all of a sudden it becomes complicated because that's why you have these principles, you know, like single responsibility principle, to try and encourage you not to do that. But there's nothing in OO that forces you to do it that way. And what I'm saying about the pipeline approach is if you do follow the pipeline approach, you're sort of forced to do it. You, you know, you don't really have a choice. Um, to have you, you're forced to do single responsibility. You can't really have multiple responsibilities. 
So the the style that you program in kind of it, it, it pushes you in a certain way. Now I'm not saying the object programming can't be clean, um, but it's very very easy to slip into a bad style and and without without constant reminding yourself that you shouldn't do it that way. Um, mm -hmm. But with pipeline oriented programming, it kind of forces you into that style whether you want to or not. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're working in a team. Um, it's it's nice it's nice when it when the when the, the the style that you use kind of forces you in a certain direction you know uh, that can be kind of useful you don't you can't accidentally deviate in OO there's all these rules and guidelines to to try and remember to not do it that way but there's nothing that forces you to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting question from Alexander Sosoyev. Is it possible to write recursion using pipelines? Yes, you can. You can call yourself. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can do recursive mm -hmm. pipeline, mm -hmm. and that's how you would do a loop in pipeline-oriented programming. Because I mean, I said that there was you can do branching. You saw me do some branching, but how would I actually do? How would I, if I needed to do a loop, how would I do a loop? And the answer is, yeah, you just call yourself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I mean, a, a very simple example of if I'm writing a pipeline-oriented uh, application, and it's like let's say it's talking to a website. What I do is I have a pipe, a, a, a component that like does a, a call to a website, does a get or something, like to download something. But if I get back a, a server unavailable or something, um, I might want to wait a few seconds and try again, right? So I, I try three or four times before I give up. So in that case, I just, you know, in my branch, I say, if I succeed, I, I come out. If I haven't succeeded, I call myself again. And I keep, mm -hmm. count, I keep track of how many times I call myself. And if I've called myself too many times, then I need to break because obviously I don't want to get into an infinite loop. But yeah, mm -hmm. so you can totally use the same components. In fact, that's one of the nice things about componentizing. You can actually write a component that will take any, the thing of trying things a certain number of times, you can actually encapsulate that as a component where you pass in another component and it will it will do that n number of times before it gives up. Mm -hmm. So I, I could even in my, in my web, in that web framework that I was showing you, there might even be something like that, but it was something that would be easy to build you just take any block of code and you run it a number of times until it succeeds. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very, you get reusable code that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think we may have time for one or two more questions mm -hmm. before we go to Zoom. Uh, the question from Alexei Terechen, how you debug pipelines? Uh, you put breakpoints between each pipeline, each step, if you want. Um, how do you, do, how, in the same way you debug any, any code, mm -hmm. Um, you can step through it. I mean, how do you debug link code, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this link is is pipeline. So you put a break. If you want to see, you can either start at the top and you can sort of step through it, or you can put a breakpoint in the middle and see what you're doing at that point. Or you could saw me. I could stick a logging method. If you don't, if you can't do a debugger, you saw me stick a logging method right in the middle of the pipeline. So if I wanted to debug either whether it's link code or any kind of code, I could just log the input and the output, you know, and, 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 be, and because these logging functions don't change the behavior, I can, I can put them in and take them out, and I know that I'm not going to break anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of different ways of debugging, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I <laughs> think we are approaching the end of an hour, and let me check if you have a link to uh, Zoom uh, channel. Uh, yes, there is a link to Zoom channel. So I think uh, there are still questions. Uh, as I said, there are many questions. So um, uh, I think uh, we just go to the discussion room. Um, and yeah, with that, I thank you very much, Scott, for, for an excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah it was great, fun. great interest. Yeah, okay, thank good. you. Thank we'll, you so much. We'll continue the discussion room in a minute. Okay, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.